Well, thank you. If you, if you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3, we're going to look at a text that's kind of familiar to some of us, and maybe you've forgotten about it. Just something that kind of uh, speaks to us about the changes that are going on in the early church at this time. In Acts chapter 3, they've just gotten through the, the day of Pentecost. We had that a while back. We talked about the Holy Spirit's arrival on the scene and empowerment of believers. And uh, Peter and John are going about their business, so we'll kind of look at Acts chapter 3, if you would, in honor of reading God's Word. Would you stand with me, please, for a few moments? Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, we want to look at this morning. All right. Luke writes, he says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour to pray. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they had used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze upon him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple and beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the faithfulness of the disciples as they simply were obedient to your call upon their lives in this moment and in many moments in their lives and ministry here on earth. And Father, I pray that we would have that same sense of understanding and faithfulness when your spirit prods us and moves us towards action that we would do whatever it is you command. Because in things like that, Father, you are able to receive glory to often do things that seem strange to us, but by our faithfulness to you, your glory, your grace is proclaimed, and your name is exalted in the nations. Bless this time and use it as you desire, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we have here before us this morning kind of an interesting encounter. Just kind of lay the backdrop for you. <clears throat> Peter and John are doing what they always did. They were going about the ninth hour of the day to go to the temple and to pray. And a lot of people would gather for prayer time, much like a kind of like a, it wasn't necessarily a worship service, but people would go into the temple and they would spend time praying and, and getting their hearts and minds focused. And this large crowd as it goes in, oftentimes on the way when there's a place where there's a large crowd, there were people that would gather there and they would beg. It was their sustenance, it was their livelihood. And many times in that culture and even in other parts of the world I've seen today in, in parts of Eastern Europe and Central America, You'll see folks that are in a wheelchair or with crutches or whatever, or sometimes they are, have a sign saying they're blind, help me, or whatever, and they'll, they'll literally be having their hand out or some sort of something to catch money in, and people will contribute money. And what better time to ask for help than when people are going to church, right? We should have a sense of compassion. We should have a sense of focus. And these people are on their way in the temple to worship God. And this man is there, and it says he's brought there. Obviously, he's lame. He can't walk. He can't take care of himself. He can't provide or do anything for his family. If he has a family, we don't know. And while he's there waiting, hoping to receive money, he receives something he doesn't expect. And isn't that kind of the way that God works in our lives? Sometimes you're moving along and you're just going around the motions, doing everything you've always done, the way you've always done it, and thinking this is the way it's supposed to be, and then suddenly God shows up and just messes up everything. It's what he does. And a lot of that he does not because he likes to mess things up. No, God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of order. He brings things to, into clear, concise focus. And perhaps that's what he's trying to do with us is to help us understand what he is doing in our lives and how he is changing us. And in this moment, Peter and John are simply on their way to worship. They encounter this man. And has anyone ever encountered someone begging and, not wonder, and wonder what to do? Uh, most of us have, I think. Sometimes we feel kind of weird. Should we, shouldn't we? You know, are we just helping them? You know, and you hear the stories of the guy that's collecting and then he goes and gets in his, you know, whatever, his sports car around the corner. I don't know if those are true. We just hear those. So how do we respond? And I'm not telling, this, the focus this morning is how to tell you how to respond when you see someone panhandling in front of you. That's not the focus. The focus is to be faithful to, to demonstrate our faith in our Savior Anything 
no money on them at the time to give the man. And they said, we don't have any money for you. I'm sure he was disappointed when he heard that. Well, why are you talking to me then? I mean, I'm here to earn some money or earn to get some money so I can take care of some things to continue my meager standard of living to go with things the way they are and you're interrupting this. So get out of the way. I'm, I'm sure he wanted to say didn't. Get out of the way. Let someone else come that has some money, right? Because that's what he was there for. But they were there for a different reason. They were there to change his life in ways that he probably, I'm sure he had no idea when he got up that morning and got himself ready and and his friends came to pick him up and take him there to the temple so he'd be ready on time when the folks came in that he could beg and hopefully receive some sustenance for the week and all those kind of things. I'm sure that was not on his mind that that day was the day he was going to walk. But I love what Peter says. Of course, in the King James, it translates it, silver and gold have I none. That's a little more poetic. It doesn't matter how it was said. He had no money. I have no money is basically what he's saying. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he takes him by the hand. He just doesn't say, get up, we'll see you later. Hope you have fun. He grabs him. He puts faith to his prayer. Think about that. You're standing there next to a man who is not able to walk, and you say in the name of, he puts Jesus on the spot, literally, doesn't he? Now, some people say that would be tempting the Lord God, and, and there's some that have struggled with that, but in that moment, obviously the Holy Spirit was prompting Peter to do this. I don't think Peter was just kind of doing this thinking, well, this would be really cool if we did this in the temple. We're going to just do something really neat because we can. No, his focus was on being faithful, and I believe he was listening to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit told him to do this. And imagine what that was like for that man. And my hope is that none of you experience paralysis. I've never experienced any, but we've all, many of us, some of us have been in the hospital and been rather weak and not been able to get up. I can remember my experience, my one experience in the hospital, which is enough for me. I'm really hoping not to go back. I may go back one day. We all may. You know, you never know. Can't control that. But I was very weak and I had not been up for a few days. And the first time I got up to get around, it was kind of a weird feeling. So I can't imagine that. I wonder what it's like for years not being able to walk and someone begins to lift you up and all the way your body's like, whoa, what are you doing here? And this man had not felt his legs in who knows how long. No strength to do anything, not to move up, to push. And when we think about those things kind of trivially, those of us that are able to walk and get up and move around with great ease. But think about not being able to do that, not just for a day or two or a week or two, but imagine for years you've not felt anything in your lower legs. You've not been able to push up. You've not been able to take a step. And some crazy guy comes up and puts his hand out to you and says, get up. So what was going through his mind in those moments, I wonder? But I wonder what it was like in his mind as suddenly he began to feel those legs again. Suddenly they began to have strength. Suddenly he began to have the ability to get up. And as he instinctively begins to push up. Some, some, he can push. Those muscles that almost literally had atrophy, that there was nothing there, it seemed like. They were weak. They were with beyond anything that you can, you know, there's nothing there, it seemed like there it is. In an instant, in a moment, as Peter lifts up his hands and gets him up, he's suddenly able to stand. And evidently, he was in pretty good shape after that because what's to say he did? He did? He did dance. Now, I know we Baptists get disturbed by that a little bit, because dancing bothers us, right? Well, maybe not all of us. But that's what it says in, our, in your church covenant, if you've ever read it. Most of us haven't, but you should. It's, it's good to read that. And he dances and is excited. And he goes, and he goes into the temple dancing. Because he's so excited, he starts praising God for what's happened. And all these people look like, wait a minute. I just gave that guy a couple bucks when I came in. Well, well what's going on here? I don't, they didn't use dollars, but I'm just using that as an expression. You understand that, right, folks? Okay, I'm making sure you're, is everybody awake? I realize we're kind of, we're really leaning heavy to my right this morning. I'm not sure what that's about. I don't know what y'all did over here, but something's, everybody's on this side. Everybody take a bath on this side, I hope, right? Okay, no, I'm just kidding. But we, we see that, we see Peter, this man, he's up. He hasn't walked and he's up and he's going, and he's going crazy, it says in the scripture. Read it. He goes to the temple dancing and praising God and people are amazed. Now, if I saw someone who hadn't walked for years, and I knew it because I'd walk by him every day at the temple, feeling guilty about not giving them anything, or should I give something, and kind of having that go through my head, and then suddenly I see them up and about. 
I wouldn't think I'd been scanned because, I mean, how do you fake that out for that many years? And why would you do that for that many years? Like, what is going on here? This doesn't happen every day. In fact, it doesn't happen at all. Because we had plans just to go through our day. I mean, I, I wonder what was going through the worshipers' minds as they were there in the temple. They're getting ready to have their time of, of worship with God and, and all the different rituals that were going on. And this guy comes in the middle of their service. He doesn't ask for permission. He doesn't ask the priest, can I do this? He just comes in screaming, praise God, hallelujah. I mean, I don't what it's going. He's just coming from the back. Can you imagine what would happen to us today? If somebody came in that back door and started screaming, praise God, hallelujah, what would we, how would we react? Amen. Amen. All right. Would we really? <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. You get a bunch of us together, and it's kind of when people come in, it disturbs our order. And he's disturbing their order because God often does that to us too. I don't believe our God loves the mundane as much as we think he does. I think his focus is upon, uh, upon showing his grace and power and being glorified. And I think, he, I think he appreciates a little emotionalism every now and then. It's okay to smile in church. Did you know that? It is not going to displease God. Yeah, I know we're good at being solemn sometimes, and there are times for being solemn. That is true. A part of, that's a part of worship. But another part of worship is simply expressing who you are in Christ and allowing others to see him through you. Well, that's a whole other sermon I don't have time for today. But the focus here is that what... I love the response. Let's go back a bit. When, when they, he's asking them for money, he's sticking out the hand or the bowl or whatever he's got to receive his alms in. And rather than giving him what he thinks he needs, which is money, just to get by, just to keep moving forward, just to live the life that he has, what does Peter say? Can't help you there, bud. I have none of that. But what you really need, what, what really will change your life, I do have. Now, that's more than what he says, but that's really what he's saying, isn't he? It's more than just money that you, that you need. And we both know what you really need. What you really need is you need to get up and walk. You need to be healed. You need to be delivered from this so that you can begin to earn a living yourself. You can take care. You can enjoy life like the rest of us, getting up and moving around. You need that more than you need money, don't you? And most of us know when we are ill and we are suffering or when our family, or we have relatives or family members who are suffering, what they want more is it's not money. What they want is to be better, isn't it? It's to be healed. When we are sick, when we are hurting, we want to be, we want to be better. We want just to feel better. We want to be right. We want our bodies to function properly. And that's what this man really needed in that moment. And that's what he got. Not because of Peter and John. It really has very little to do about these two men of God. And they will tell you that. It's not about them and what they bring to the table. It's not, they didn't do anything out of the ordinary. They didn't, it doesn't say here that they waved a special thing and set a magic formula and sprinkled fairy dust on him. And it says none of that, does it? All he says is in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. He acts upon the faith that he's been given. He's seen Jesus do this who knows how many times. Can you imagine what it was like to spend Three and a half years of your life walking around with Jesus and watching him speak and preach and, and heal people. Watching him put his eyes on the blind and open the ears of the deaf, cause the lame to walk by simply saying, stand up. You remember in one circumstance where the, the friends brought the guy in the room, remember through the roof, you remember that? You know, they were, the, the room was so crowded to get in, they couldn't get in, and so what did they do? They bring the guy, they dug a hole in the roof, didn't ask for permission, didn't go get a permit, they just did it. They didn't ask the owner. They just did it. They built a hole in the roof and they lowered him down into the right, not right in front of Jesus. I always love that story from the text. I, lo I love that narrative. I love the what it says because I, I just, there's so many things there. I'd almost preach on that this morning, but I'm not. That's okay. As I love what, 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 what they, the Jesus, it, it almost as if when that happens, I wonder when he saw the first twig start coming through and he knew what was going to happen because I mean, he's God, right? He knows what's going to happen. I wonder if he smiled. I bet he did. Because he knew what was coming. He said, this is going to be good. He didn't say anything. He just, he just kept teaching, you know, undistracted, focused on what he was doing. And then, well, then he couldn't help it, you know, because then clods of dirt. I mean, they didn't have a roof like this. I mean, it was a thatched roof. I mean, it was just dirt and leaves or whatever else they could put up there, straw, whatever they could get to cover the house. That's all it was. It was nothing of real circum of, of substance. And it starts to come through. And then there's a hole. And I'm, you know, when you dig a hole in a roof, I would assume you'd first look down before you put anybody down there, wouldn't you? So I could see a head sticking over. Can't you see that? 
There's a head sticking looking, okay, it's all right. And they have to make the hole wide enough to put this guy in. Of course, I mean, I don't think they make it huge, but big enough where they lower him down. And I mean, th these guys must've knew a little bit about physics and stuff like that. Cause I mean, they were bouncing him with that, with ropes and almost like a, without a pulley and just putting him down there and they laid him right in front of Jesus. And what happened? Jesus said, well, that was really neat. I'm glad you did that. Thanks for disrupting our Bible study. No, that's not what he said. That wasn't the focus. But what happened that moment is that man was going to get up and he was going to walk and Jesus just did it right in front of everybody. But it wasn't because of the faith of him. What does he say in that text? You can look back and see it. It's in both, I think, Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel that record this, this event. And it says, because of the faith of your friends, because of their faith in bringing you to me, get up and walk. Take up your mat and go home. You're done with this kind of life. And the guy that couldn't walk suddenly, much like the gentleman we're looking at here, limbs that hadn't been used for a long time, suddenly have strength in them begin feeling and all those things are just coming back and suddenly what well, something he hasn't done in a long time he's able to do and he's able to push himself off the floor crouch then stand maybe a little lightheaded for a second or two who knows but then he picks up that mat and he's out of there and he's excited just like this gentleman's excited because when we encounter Jesus things change Did you hear what I said? When you encounter Jesus, when I encounter, when we encounter our Savior, things change. That is one of the dirtiest words in Baptist life. Is it not? We hate the word change. We don't say that out loud, but a lot of times we do because we like things the way they are. We've got our routines. We've got the way we have it, the way it's always been done. We like that about our faith and about life, but sometimes God says, that's nice, but I want to do it a new way. I've got a different purpose and plan. I'm trying to do things in ways that I want to do. And really what we're about as a church is not about doing things the way we want them done, but doing what our Savior wants to do through us. Because everything we do should exalt Him. Every word I say, every song we sing, everything we do in this church, and even more importantly, outside the four walls of this church and this community, should be about bringing the name of Jesus glory. Should it not? Every ministry we do should be about that. Whether you're teaching preschoolers in Sunday school class, or whether you're teaching adults in Sunday school, whether you're working in, in the kitchen, whether you're working in a, another ministry in our church, whatever it is, all of that is for the purpose of bringing people to Christ. And we all are on board together with that. That is our focus and our meat. It's, it's so they can engage and encounter the one who loves them more than they can ever understand. And the one who is able to say to them, get up and walk. Now, anybody can say that. I've watched the guys on, on television on certain channels that I'll leave nameless, TBN, and others that do that. Maybe it happens for, maybe God does that sometimes. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to get into that debate today. That's not my, my focus. I know God is able. Without question, God is able. I have seen God do some things that don't make sense to me, but he does them anyway. He's done them in my own life. I've seen him do in the lives of others. See, and one of the, some of the most amazing things I've seen haven't been miracles like this, although this would be, I'd love to see this. this would, I would love to have been there. That would have been really awesome to see, don't you think? Be around Peter and John. They're just walking around the you know, on their way into worship at the temple, and there's this guy laying there that's been there for a long time, and get up and walk, and whoa, that, and then the guy goes dancing in the, that, that would be neat to see. I'd like to see that. But you and I have both seen God change lives in ways that are really hard to fathom, impossible to explain as the Holy Spirit does his work in the hearts and lives of people. Sometimes the biggest and most amazing work is the changing of the mind. Sometimes we get so entrenched in our thinking, so entrenched in the way that we see life that we forget God is bigger than we are. And I, I always wonder, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm one of those people, and maybe this is my flaw, I have many. One of my flaws is I, I like to know all the, kind of the background. I, I, I don't just want the story, I want the background. That's why I'm a, anybody remember Paul Harvey? Okay, those of you that are younger than me, you probably, Paul who? Is that, you know, I, is that related to Steve Harvey? No, they're not related. I like Steve Harvey too, by the way. But anyway, Paul Harvey was, had a talk. He had a, kind of like a little blurb. It would, every day it would come on. It was called The Rest of the Story. You remember? 
And he would always share the rest of the story. And he'd share some blurb that everybody knew about, some little event that we all remember. It was a little, he'd go, then he'd go, now let me tell you the rest of the story. And that was kind of what he did. That was kind of his mantra for all the years he was alive and on mostly radio. I don't know if you ever read a TV show. I know he was on radio all the time. That's where I always listen to him. But I love that idea. And I wonder when we get to heaven if we're going to get to hear some rest of the stories. The background, what was going on? What was going on in the hearts and lives of these people? What about this, this man's family? He obviously had friends that cared enough for him to bring him to Jesus. Or not Jesus at that point. They were just bringing him to the temple. They didn't realize they were really going to change his life. You know, it's good to go to church. It's good to go to worship. It's good to encounter the fellowship. That changes you. But what really, the only one that can really change your life is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that has the ability to, to completely transform you and make you into the man or woman that God wants you to be. He can change us in ways that humanity can, the way that education can't do it, behavior modification doesn't work, all those different things that we try to use to change people, they help to a degree. But if you want to really change, you need to have some time with Jesus. He will change you. And that's what he did for this gentleman. But I don't think it was just this gentleman. I just wonder what it was like for everybody else. They were sitting in ready for their time of prayer, very quiet and reverent when this guy comes storming through the doors, praising God. And it might have disrupted them for a moment, but I wonder if there were any there that like, huh, I wonder how this happened. I'd like to know more about what happened to this guy today because I've seen him for the last so many years sitting there waiting for, begging for money. How did this happen today of all days and why am I here to experience that? And sometimes that's the way God works in our lives. It's those unexpected moments when we see him at work in the lives of someone else that begins to cause us to ask those questions and begin to wonder and think, God, what are you doing? And how can I be a part of it? So what is all this, this story from nearly 2,000 years ago out of the book of Acts, what does this have to do with a bunch of Baptists sitting in Frederick, Maryland at South End Baptist Church, right? That's what you want to know. What does it have to do with me today? I mean, really, what, what's the point of this? I mean, it's a nice story. It really says a lot. But I want to share just a couple thoughts, and then I'm going to let you go. Something is happening in our world today. Something unexplainable is happening in our world today. We don't talk about it, and you will not see this on the, on the news, even on Fox. It doesn't matter. No news or whoever news you like. Fox, NBC, CBS. I don't know. PBS still does news. I don't know who does news anymore. CNN, all of them. You'll never hear about what is going on. But I'd encourage you to just get on, online and check out some websites. Look at the International Mission Board's website, imb.org. You can find it and hear some of these stories. Ministries like Gospel for Asia and other ministries like that. There's many ministries that will report to you. Open Doors is another one that, that talks about that. God is doing something amazing in the world. Lives are being changed and transformed. People who are far from God are coming to Christ in, in just in ways that don't make sense, except God's doing it. The other day I was reading a story, I believe it was uh, from the IMB, was sharing this story about a missionary couple that was in an undisclosed location, put the words in closed country, a place where the gospel is, is banned, literally. It is not allowed to be spoken. I don't know what they did. They can't say what for their protection. They don't say, but this couple's been there for a while, been serving in this area of the world, and really with not much fruit, because it's hard work. They're a young couple. They've got a couple of small children. And they were very discouraged, and then, and then something happened. It was a Sunday like every other Sunday where they gather with their small group of believers in their undisclosed location, gathering together for worship, spending time in some song, not, a, not, not the kind of fanfare we're able to have here today, not the kind of talent that we're blessed with here, not in the size gathering that we have. They're gathered almost in a, barely as big as the, and me in, this, in the front pew, this area here, not even that large, praying and praising God. And then God showed up that morning in the lives of a woman they had been working with for three years since they'd been there. In fact, it was the first time in all the times they had invited her that they remembered her showing up on Sunday morning. 
And she shared a story with him how something had happened to her during the week, how, God had, how, how, someone, how somehow she had miraculously had enough to take care of her family or her and her three small children. She had all these things that she couldn't figure out, and she, she just felt this urge. She needed to come to church and figure, come to this place. She'd heard about it and find out what's going on. And as that whole process unfolded, this young couple was able to share with her the gospel of Christ. Her life was changed. She became a follower, a believer of Christ in the midst of that, all because of what took place outside of the church walls that they had no idea was going on, but who was doing it? God. Even though it didn't look like in their small gathering every week, God was not at work. God was at work, not necessarily in the gathering, maybe he was, but he was also at work in the community because they were earnestly praying for God to do something. In the life of this young woman and her family, it did. And this little church began to see that happen. And I think of that, I think a lot of times we think, God, you're not doing anything. And yet God is at work. You know, a lot of people have made comments, misinformed comments, that they need to do better demographic studies of what the fastest growing religion in the world is. If I say that, most people are going to say Islam, right? That's incorrect. Outside of the United States, outside of Europe, the fastest growing religion in the world, without question, is Christianity. It's not even close. What is happening in Africa, in the continent right now, in the sub-Saharan region specifically, is the closest thing to the gospel of Acts we have ever seen. People are coming to Christ and, and, and just, and a lot of it is happening in Muslim communities where men and women are hearing, are seeing dreams and literally they will say that Jesus came to me in my dream and it's through the power of prayer of the saints and God is at work. Now, I'm not saying the battle is over, but I'm saying he, his truth is going to prevail, brothers and sisters. It's at work. And we're seeing the Spirit of God at work in many different pockets of the world, but for some reason we're not seeing it here and in Europe. I don't know why that is. I don't have an explanation. But I don't know about you, but I want to see Jesus reign supreme in our country. How about you? I want to see his name exalted. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking politics here, folks. I'm not talking about who gets elected. I don't really care who gets elected. It's not about that. It's about Christ being Lord of our lives and his witness, his word being spread throughout our culture that it's not something that we just talk about on Sunday morning. It's something that changes us every day of the week. You see, the difference what happened in the book of Acts, I'm going to be honest with you here, and what's happening today in much of the church in the West, and that's who I'm focusing on because that's what we're a part of, is it wasn't a Sunday morning activity. It was a daily devotion to God. It wasn't so much that they wanted and ex they, they expect to see something, yes, but it wasn't that they were trying to see something. They just were trying to be faithful. And they trusted that God would do what God would do. And they were just going to do what he told them to do. And if it worked out great, if it didn't, fine, but we're going to do it again. We're going to keep doing it till God decides to do what he wants to do. And eventually, God will do what he says he's going to do. He always does what he says he's going to do, doesn't he? Is there a time in your life, there have been times you thought he wasn't faithful, but in the long run, doesn't he always prove to be faithful? And that's what this is about. You can trust him. You can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your future. You can trust him in every aspect of what you need. And I love the statement here. Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the faithfulness of Peter and John. Thank you for the faithfulness of those who have come in days past and, and even today. And I pray, Father, that our hearts will be attuned to what you're desiring to do in us and through us. And we'll trust you and we'll walk as you lead us. Focus our hearts and minds more keenly upon your presence and work in us as you direct us and lead us to do what you've asked us to do, whatever that is. And that's different in each and every one of our lives. There's not specifics that I have, but you have those specifics. You just call each of us to be faithful to you and to trust you. Bless this time, Father, and use it for your purposes in whatever way you desire. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.